Thank you for joining us on Sports News Africa, the home of Africa's sporting conversation. There's plenty to talk about on the program today, and here are some of the stories coming up. Kick It Out comes to the defense of Yaya Toure after social media abuse. It's D-Day for Morocco as CAF awaits their decision on hosting the AFCON tournament. And Chad De Claus speaks to Sports News Africa after swimming accolade. Watching Sports News Africa, I'm Tomes Kandevasai. Ivory Coast international Yaya Toure was the subject of racial abuse this week after the player reactivated his Twitter account. Toure called the abusive messages a disgrace. The organization at the forefront of tackling racism in football, Kick It Out, said it had reported the incident to the British police. We can now talk to Paul Mortimer, a former footballer who played for Aston Villa and Crystal Palace and was also an assistant manager for the Sierra Leone national side. He is currently Kick It Out's professional players engagement manager. Paul, what are your thoughts on the abuse Toure was subjected to? Well, my thoughts on the abuse that, that Yaya Toure was subjected to was it was deeply distressing. It was disappointing that it's happened again. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's distressing not just for him, it's for his family too and his friends. Everyone has to go through this and it's, it really was disappointing. And I think it's about time that the real sort of direct action was taken now. Can you expand on what you mean by direct action? Well, um, what we want to do is, um, you know, in terms of punishments and sanctions, they've, they've got to be severe enough to form a, a deterrent so that people know, because people are choosing to do this. This is not accidental, you know, it's not a slip of the tongue. People are choosing to, to take part in illegal behaviour. So the action has to be swift and direct, and, and, it, and it doesn't matter who it's against, you know, fans, uh, players, whoever. I think as a victim, because, you know, Yo is a victim of abuse, what he needs to know is he needs to have faith in the authorities that they're going to deal with it properly so that if it happens again, he has no problems. He understands that the, the perpetrators will be found and will be punished. Does the fact that he is a high-profile player who stands up to racism make him an easy target? Um, his profile will definitely make a difference. Obviously, there's some people out there who will you know, target people that's profile is high, especially as he's, he's um, spoken out very well, actually, about uh, aspects of, of, of racism. But all this does is highlight the need for education, the need for action, the need for all the authorities all over Europe to start taking these incidences a little bit more seriously than they are currently. Now, in an interview following the incident, Toure himself said um, he never hears of this in rugby or tennis. So why do you think this problem persists in football? Well, I think you have to understand about football. Is it, it, it's a very team-orientated game. Um, you know, historically, um, home supporters, their job was to make the, 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 their stadium as hostile as possible for the away supporters. So that's where the abuse and, and, and the hostilities, I think, originated. Now, what's happened with society and, 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 and with difference and people that are different in skin colour, faith or whatever, coming into stadiums, there becomes more to talk about. Now, again, all of these, these incidences, they're not football's issue, they're society's issue. And as society changes, people's view on people that are different changes. And if you look at football, which was a work, working class white man's game, especially in England, you know, you look at the cross-section of supporters that go and watch games now. It's incredibly diverse. If you look on the pitch, it's incredibly diverse. So there is all of this change that, that people have, have, have had to come uh, deal with. And I, I think they find it difficult, some people. And so the easiest thing to do is, is abuse people based on things like their skin colour and their nationality and, and their faith. And, um, and, and, and that's their job. The fans' job is to make the, 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 their ground as hostile as possible for, for the opponents. And that's, what I think, where it originated. Now, this comes in the same week Bodo coach Willy Sagnol labelled African players as lacking intelligence and discipline. And the coach of Russian club Rostov had to apologise for remarks about dark-skinned players. What, what do you think these incidents say about European football? First of all, they need to take these things seriously. They need to go and speak to these coaches because 
These are very dangerous things to say. I mean, you know, Willie Sagnol, uh, I think, played with with African <laughs> players of African origin who were some of the world's best players. So for him to come out and say something like that would probably be deeply distressing to what what were his his own teammates. You know, as for the 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 uh, the, the, the Russian uh, um, uh, uh, team, Rostov, and then the manager, that's scary. Russia are about to uh, have been awarded the World Cup, the, the next World Cup. So there's going to be an influx of people that are different, different skin colours and, and everything coming into that country. Now, you a FIFA need to step in, and this is where the direct action comes in. They need to go into these these uh, countries and really uh, uh, deal with the situation. They need to go and speak to coaches who say things like this and and make them aware that the effect that this is having on on players. I mean, Rostov have five black players at least. You know how what effect does that have on those players? You know, I, personally, I couldn't play for that manager. I couldn't play for him. So, you know, this is where, where FIFA have the opportunity to go in and really deal with these things and make an example to other clubs and, and, and throughout Europe that this is not acceptable. OK, Paul Mortimer from Kick It Out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. To Morocco next, and as the government there mulls over whether or not to host a 2015 Africa Cup of Nations tournament because of the Ebola epidemic, Casablanca residents have been giving their opinions on the subject, which has gripped the continent. The Confederation of African Football insists the date for the tournament will not be moved and has given Morocco until Saturday to decide. In less than three months, one of Africa's premier football events is scheduled to kick off, but a challenge never experienced before is threatening to complicate the tournament. The outbreak of the deadly Ebola virus in West African countries has given event hosts Morocco cold feet. The 2015 AFCON hosts has been pushing to have the January 17th to February 8th event postponed due to fears that hundreds of thousands of football fans will flood the country and spread the deadly Ebola virus to its people. The virus has already killed more than 4,500 people in West Africa. However, the Confederation of African Football, CAF, the continent's football governing body, said after a meeting with Moroccan officials on Monday that there would be no postponement and gave Morocco until on Sunday. Saturday to decide whether or not they will host the tournament. We are not against the idea for hosting the competition in Morocco. There is no harm, but there is also the Ebola issue. We need to limit the virus to spread to where it only exists. If it exists only in some places in Africa, we need to keep it there until we resolve this problem. The virus may spread to Morocco. There is a possibility of a huge psychological damage to the country, more than physical. People will be afraid of Ebola and may not even go to study. I am fine about the organization of this competition in Morocco for different reasons. The first one is that our national team is already preparing. They had many friendly matches. The second reason is the European schedule. I think most football clubs will allow their African players to play in the tournament. I don't think the Ebola virus will be a danger in our country. CAF has placed a ban on three countries ravaged by Ebola, Sierra Leone, Guinea and Liberia, from hosting any international football matches. Yasin Marach, a sports analyst, said the Ebola epidemic is the worst nightmare to football in Africa, but everybody is waiting anxiously for the government's decision. Well, of course not everyone is waiting for this uh, big tournament to, to see their home team playing here in Morocco. The African Cup, or the, the last African Cup, was organized um, in the 88. Uh, in the last century, so uh, I think it was uh, uh, very important for the Moroccans to, to see their country playing the African Cup and the opening game, especially here in uh, Marrakesh. Marash, however, backed Morocco officials for their decision for seeking a postponement of the tournament until the virus is brought under control. Uh, I think Morocco made uh, uh, a perfect decision, as I think to uh, try to postpone the, uh, the African Cup of Nations, the AFCON here in Morocco. But uh, meanwhile, I think the, the African Confederation, the CAF, is looking for another, um, another country to organize this 
this big tournament. Uh, I think he's not uh, willing to uh, to postpone the the African Cup or uh, to uh, to cancel the African Cup here in Morocco. Another meeting is scheduled for November 11th in Cairo, Egypt, where CAF will make the final decision on the matter. Teams from the hard-hit countries of Guinea and Sierra Leone have been forced to play their home matches elsewhere as the fear of the virus grips the continent. Welcome back to Sports News Africa. South African swimmer Chad Leclos was crowned the overall male champion following this year's International Swimming Federation World Cup, which concluded in Singapore this week. The award makes Leclos the best all-round swimmer of the year, an accolade he also claimed in 2011 and 2013. At only 22, he is already regarded as one of the best swimmers of all time. That is an unbelievable achievement, and we can now speak to the man himself who joins us on the line. Chad, how do you feel about being the overall best swimmer at the World Cup for a third time? Well, uh, firstly, hi, everybody. Um, I think, you know, for me, it was a huge uh, shock for me, actually, this year because we started off the World Cups um, about two months ago and uh, not knowing what to expect, you know, after the Commonwealth Games, I think. And uh, it's just been really, really amazing. And I'm just, I'm really, really proud, obviously, to be the first male to, uh, you know, win it three times in a row. Well, sorry three times um, over four years. And uh, yeah, I'm just really, really excited. It's interesting that you are one of the few top class South African swimmers who haven't made the USA your base. Why is that? Well, for me, um, you know, there was obviously uh, a lot of swimmers in South Africa leave you know, to go to the US to go train or, or train abroad. And I think my reasoning is just because I have everything. Yeah, you know, I have a great coach um, who I've been with for 15 years now. Uh, Graham Hill, an assistant coach to Lon Danhauser. And, um, you know, I still have my family, which I still live with. I have my own little apartment on top of their place, which is ideal for me. So I get to yeah visit them on weekends. I always tease them about that. But uh, it's just really great that I have everything all together. And I think a lot of people have, uh, I don't know, in South Africa think that it's better to go overseas. But for me, like I said, I have everything here. I have the, you know, my old high school is, you know, 10 minutes from where I live. And, you know, the studying varsity is also like five minutes away. So... Yeah. Do you think your international profile will make sponsors sit up and commit themselves to getting involved in SA swimming? Because most of the sponsorship is going to sports like football, um, rugby and cricket. Well, I do believe, uh, well, I definitely believe that corporate South Africa and, you know, international sponsors should get more involved in, you know, South African swimming. I think um, if you look at us pro rata, you know, we one of the best sporting codes in the world. I mean, not just in South Africa, but even in the world. I mean, we had, we had two Olympic champions from London and we only have 3,500 registered swimmers in South Africa. Whereas if you look at, uh, let's just say America, we have like 350,000 registered swimmers and they only have, you know, 11 or 12 Olympic champions. So in, 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 in pro rata, we, we really up there. And I think um, that's a way to just, maybe if we had more, you know, sponsors, I think in South Africa, a lot of more youngsters would have the opportunity to come through and to travel, I think that's the most important thing because, you know, when I was young, I had the opportunity to travel when I was really, really young to, uh, you know, to Rome and, and Europe and race all the top guys. And uh, I think that gave me a lot of experience. So hopefully that can happen in the next few years. Chad, tell us about your training schedule you follow that enables you to be performing at such a consistently high level. My training schedule uh, basically is we swim about nine or ten sessions of swimming a week. It's usually Monday mornings, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday mornings um, for about an hour and 45 to two and a half hours a session, just depending on the week of training. And then we train every afternoon except for Saturday and Sundays. So basically Sunday is our rest day. And um, once or twice a week, I'll, I'll do a light uh, gym, well, gym core kind of program. I don't do many weights, but uh, yeah, it's, it's probably about 20, we worked it out about 23 to 25 hours of, of training a week. So it's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty grueling program for me, and I've I've done that for many years. And uh, yeah, I'm lucky in South Africa. When Durban, we have a we have beautiful weather, you know. So it's 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 always helps to you know, train outdoors. I think. You've got all the gold medals. So I guess the only jewel missing from your crown is the absence of world records. Is that something that bothers you? Well, I definitely want to. You know, my goals for next year at the, at the World Champs. I try to to get close to the world records in the, the 100 butterfly and the 200 butterfly. Um, I think it's really difficult. Uh, you know, we see the, the post-suit era, I think it was really hard 
now to, to break all records. I think for me, short course, um, well, I've broken, I've broken two since, since last year. And uh, recently on the World Cups, I missed uh, about seven or eight times. But um, long course is going to be a lot harder. I mean, obviously, Michael Phelps' world records in the suit are um, going to be a big challenge for me. But I believe that come, come 2016, I hopefully will be breaking those world records and um, you know, adding, more, adding more to my arsenal of events. I think that's, that's something that I want to try to do. Chad, thank you very much. Thanks very much for having me, guys. Uh, I'll chat to you guys soon. Okay. August. That was Chad Laclasse speaking to Sports News Africa from Durban. Well, there was more good news for South Africa as the Proteus beat Australia in the 2020 series opener. South Africa won the match by seven wickets on Wednesday as Australia were restricted to 144 for six. After the game, the South African captain said his team had a game plan and they stuck to it. And staying with cricket, Zimbabwe have been putting up a valiant fight as they, as they look rather to even the three-match series against Bangladesh and Kulna. Chasing a first innings target of 433, Zimbabwe were grateful to a third test century by Hamilton Masakatsa. Masakatsa hit 17 fours and two sixes in a knock of 158. Regis Chakapva also scored a maiden test century as the tourists finished on 368 all out. In the second innings, Bangladesh are 201 for five, a lead of 266 runs. And that's it for today. We'll have more for you on Sports News Africa tomorrow with all the latest stories from the continent and around the world. Thank you for watching and goodbye.